Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy Dowling, and this week's guest is Rusty Young, the international best-selling author. You probably remember his first book, Marching Powder, where he had a four-month voluntary stay at San Pedro Prison in Bolivia. He met a convicted drug smuggler called Thomas McFadden, who was running tours, tour groups through the prison. Now, you might think that's unusual, but this prison is unusual. So do yourself a favor, check out that book. I read it 10 plus years ago, and um, it's still one of the best books I've ever read. So I cannot recommend this book enough. Please go out and check it. It's an international bestseller. Um, most bookstores you walk into these days will still have a copy on the shelves, even after all these years, and no doubt it'll grace the shelves for years to come. Now, Rusty's just released a new book called Colombiano, which is about uh, child soldiers in Colombia, and it's focused around one young boy named Pedro who, well, I'm halfway through the book now, and I really don't want to spoil it because I do not know how to describe a book without spoiling it. So I'll let uh, I'll let Rusty explain it in this chat. Um, we caught up over in North Sydney uh, a few weeks ago. Um, he was just towards the end of his Australian book launch where he'd been going around the country and uh, doing book appearances, signing books, and talking about the, the latest book, Colombiano. And so I managed to get a hold of him, went out to his place in North Sydney, and we had a chat for an hour or so and just spoke about, well, how the hell he got to South America, what compelled him to go and hang out in a prison, and probably one of the most dangerous prisons in the world uh, for several months, and then write this amazing book, and then stay in South America for quite a few years. He ended up moving to Colombia for eight years afterwards, wrote Marching Powder, and then continued to start writing this new book. He's worked with counter-terrorism -ter contractors, US contractors in Colombia. He is so ingrained into this whole world it's um it's quite intimidating and he has got some really crazy stories a lot of this stuff's highlighted in his books um there's a lot of stuff online as well which i'll put over on the show notes on andysocial.net some really cool videos so make sure you go there and check it out um i really oh there's also a documentary that's coming out soon called wildlands i don't know the release date. it's been pushed back a few times um, I'm not sure whether Rusty mentioned it in this episode or not. Um, we did speak a little bit afterwards, but um, there were a couple of reasons for delaying the uh, the release of the documentary, and it was a little bit sensitive and involved some uh, governments uh, in other countries. So I'll leave it at that just in case he mentions it or just in case I'm not allowed to mention it. But um, there's a trailer for Wildlands, which I'll put on andysocial.net, so make sure you go over there and check it out. It's really, really cool. So enough of me. This is a really great chat. So fortunate to be able to sit down with Rusty and have a great chat with him. And I'm looking forward to catching up with him later on down the track, especially when Wildlands is out and it's had a bit of airtime and people get to know it. Um, I'd really love to pick his brain and, and learn more about uh, that whole other chapter in his life. But um, wow, what a guy. All right, guys, enjoy this episode with international best-selling author, Rusty Young. Thanks, Andy, for having me on your podcast. We made it happen. We we're here. It's been a, it's been a few months in the making. <laughs> You've had a couple of things on. Yeah, sorry, I've been on a national tour of five states of Australia, um, and very tired, but glad to be here with and you, mate. You've got um, a couple of cities still to go. Uh, yeah, I've got Melbourne Writers Festival um, Sunday week, and I've got four more Sydney events. So yep. it's been really, really busy. Lots yeah, of television, absolutely. radio. It's been a real whirlwind, but very happy with the launch for Colombiana. Oh, I've been um, I've been indirectly stalking you. <laughs> Um, because really, I'm flat. You're you up in it yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> on grinder in... or <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I was up in Brisbane um, first weekend of August, and you were up there doing your book launches there. Yeah. I'm in Melbourne next weekend. Okay. And then I thought, now I'll, I'll just wait until I wait until that period that you're in Sydney because I was going to go. Oh, by the way, while you're up there, but um, I thought I'd just go off on a bit of a tangent to begin with. Sure. Now. That's, that's the best start, a tangent. It, it is. And we'll, we'll have plenty of them. Now, <laughs> I got your book. Uh -huh. I've only just started reading it, so okay. I'm only a couple of chapters in. But um, Just read the back cover, man. That's the best part. And, <laughs> no, don't worry about the rest <laughs> of it. Um, I put a picture up on Instagram, and then a dear friend of mine contacted me and said, I went to school with that guy. Now, he's a few years younger than you, right. so you might not recall him. And I'll give you his full name later, but my sure. mate Dan, um, he sent me this message and then he went through some books and found this oh wow yeah that was from 
That was that was my nineteen ninety tools two school photo, yeah. yeah. Scott's <laughs> that's hilarious debating team. Great hair. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little kid. I was seventeen there. Yeah, wow. I'll tell you what, pretty ambitious for um for that age, you were yeah, I think, certainly heavily involved in a number of different things. Yeah, I think I put my uh, career aspiration as a playwright, didn't I? Is that yeah, you did, yeah. 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 Have, you, have you done that yet? No, that was my initial. So I started writing when I was about 12 at Scott's College. Yeah. had a really good um, English teacher in year seven called Michael Boylan, and he used to encourage us to write a, a journal, a diary. And then he would read it. If you wanted him to read it, he would read it. If you said don't read it, then he'd just check to see that you wrote it. And he used to write back to me. He said, hey, you, you know, he said, hey, kid, you've got some talent. You could be a writer. And this is when I'm 12. So that was really what set me off on the writing path. And I really loved the power and the immediacy of uh, plays, of drama. I thought it was so much more, a much more powerful medium than um, television. Mm. And, and I, you know, I wrote short stories. I, so I was, you know, I was reasonable at English at school. But play, being a playwright was my initial ambition. I think it's a really difficult thing to do and certainly difficult career path to have, yeah. particularly, you know, in Australia where the market is relatively small. Books are fantastic because you can write it and sell it all over the world. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've been pretty fortunate enough with my first book that it's sort of, you know, I'm not a millionaire, but I, you know, it's allowed me to keep writing. That's just, that's what I love doing most in the world is writing and traveling. That's cool. And mm. is, is there still an underlying desire to, to do playwright? Look, I haven't come back to it. You know, you've just reminded me of that. Um, I don't know if I've got the skill, you know, like there's different, like people assume they fear you're good at one type of writing that you're going to be good at another. So for example, people say, why don't you adapt your first book into the, why don't you write the screenplay? And it's a, writing a screenplay is, you know, they're words, the same as a novel, same as a nonfiction journalistic piece, but it's a very different skill set um, mm. to be a playwright. Um, you know, I would consider it if I had, uh, you know, when I, when I, once I'm through this, this, this hectic period, mm. I'll, you know, I need to reassess where I'm going next. So, yeah, I mean, you've reminded me. I've got to, I like to kick, I like to, f you know, fulfill my ambitions and set goals for myself. And that was the goal I set at the age of 17, and I haven't fulfilled that one. <laughs> well, I mean, you've, you have a few excuses to, <laughs> as to why that hasn't been done yet, but you've um, gone off on a couple of other tangents. I've got a number of questions to ask you about sure. writing and whatnot, and I'll get to that um at some stage down the track, but um, you're one of the first guests that I've had on where I've explained or I've been telling friends and whatnot and uh, saying who I've got coming up on the podcast. And you're the only person where I haven't needed to explain who you are. Oh, really? Especially when I just rattle off and I say marching powder and they're yeah. like, oh, that guy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Everyone else, it's like even probably oh, someone who you would think would, most people would know, such as like Tony Barber, an uh -huh. old Australian icon. Yeah. Some of the younger guys are like, who? Who's this? It was like Sale of the Century, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, but for yourself, no one, there was no extra explanation. It's like, oh, that's going to be great. So fantastic. Um, however, I will, I will know oh, that is, I do there, have. There, there's a caveat here. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> I do have a number of listeners, not from Australia, but all over the world. I've got a large listener base in Japan for whatever reason. How did you get that? I think it might be, we played in Japan quite a few years, okay. like quite a few times over the years. And I think that's just sort of leveraged off that. But um, I don't know what's actually sparked it. Right. I've tried to go through Google and other channels to see where my links are being posted, but right. cannot locate anything. But I've wow. got some friends over there and, and I think it's just going through some circles over wow. there. But um, I think maybe just not to spend a lot of time on it, because I'm sure you've gone into autopilot many times over the years, explaining some of the, the background behind some of your- We can do it quickly. We can do a quick rundown. We'll do a snapshot. Of, of Marching Powder. Yeah. So I, I guess maybe just to understand a bit of the context behind it and then um, some of the motivations to even go to that part of the world in the first place. Yeah, sure. Yep. So I was a law student. I had a fairly privileged upbringing. My parents are still together, wonderful, supportive family, beautiful younger sister, two years younger. And I, yeah, I had, was went to a private school, went to university. I did studied commerce law, so I was sort of set along, set towards going along a corporate career path. But I also loved traveling. My parents took me traveling a lot when I was when we were kids, and I also traveled all throughout university. And I always wanted to be a writer, but I didn't have, didn't feel I had that much to say. So I was always go writing, and that would always inspire me. Just the different languages, different cultures, different sights, smells, sounds. And so that I was kind of writing emails. And this is probably the precursor to blogging, you know, lots mm. of travel blogs. Mm. But back in the day, there weren't blogs. There wasn't Facebook. There wasn't Instagram. And I would just go writing and I'd write up short stories and, and email it out. And people would, you know, forward it on to their friends. And 
um, you know, basically I was just testing the waters to see if I could write, to see whether I could write anything interesting, to see whether people would like it. And then I stumbled across this prison. I was traveling with my then girlfriend, Simone Camilleri. She was my girlfriend for five years at university. We finished law together. And we just decided to go traveling before, you know, settling down to do a corporate mm. job. We <laughs> did sort of six months or so in South America. And on our last day in Bolivia, we heard of, well, we went to this prison. We'd heard about it for weeks in advance. Um, people had been talking about it all along what's called the Gringo Trail in South America. <laughs> and it was listed in the guidebooks as the world's most bizarre tourist attraction. Um, in fact, you know, they were sort of saying, if you're adventurous, go into this prison. Now, they, the guidebooks are saying the opposite. They say, don't, it's unethical. But back in the day, that was the, that was the thing that you did. And so we left our passports at the gate. We asked for a guy called Thomas. Thomas McFadden was an African boy. Uh, British English British drug trafficker drug smuggler who'd been caught with five kilograms trying to leave El Alto airport in La Paz Bolivia and he was you know, incarcerated in San Pedro so in San Pedro it's really is a, a crazy penitentiary system inmates don't wear uniforms they have the keys to their own rooms which are not really cells they're all every single cell is different it's more mm. like a ramshackle village there are eight different sections inside this prison and you have to buy your own prison cell so depending on what your budget is you can live ever you can live a, a luxurious lifestyle in the five or six star section i mean it's not quite it's like a six star hotel but in comparison by comparison yeah. yeah for a prison i mean they had internet uh, one guy had a jacuzzi uh in the, one the wealthiest guy who had 4.2 tons of cocaine in his own airplane he had a two-story apartment with a view over the city you know glass windows ensuite bathroom computers you know it was just it's carpeted floors um inc incredible incredibly uh you know independent capitalistic kind of system in there and unfortunately the, at the opposite end there's the zero one star sections where inmates you know many of them are, have drug problems uh, they don't have money in the first place they're strip petty street criminals they can't afford a good cell so they mm. live in the poor sections and um, stacked three or four inside one on top of each other basically like a like in a ship's hold you know yeah right. um we went in there we did a one-hour tour it cost five us dollars at the time half of the money went to thomas mcfadden and his bodyguards the other half went to the corrupt guards so the guards mm. were making a lot of money out of this thomas had between at the peak of the tours between 50 and 70 visitors going through uh, each day the average tour group size was 15 people so we went around uh, checked out all the prisoners met the prisoners wives and children also live in there so it's a fully functional male prison but inmates are allowed to bring their girlfriends their wives their kids their cats their dogs in there it's really <laughs> colorful uh, as i said before they don't wear uniforms so it's pretty yeah. difficult to tell the visitors from the inmates wow. and there are because the state doesn't give them much food they only give them uh, like a bowl of watery soup every day there are restaurants inside there so the inmates bring in their own food they cook inside their their cells and the guards don't go inside so the inmates run the entire prison themselves so for some of them that it, it'd probably be better for them inside than it is outside yeah for, if you have money you could mm. you could certainly live better or you know have a a, a decent li lifestyle you know you've also got to remember it's still a prison so mm. no matter how luxurious if you can't leave those four walls it's still a prison it yeah. does you know at first it seems like a bit like a hotel there's drugs there's alcohol you know you can get girls in whatever but at the end of the day it's still a prison and at night time it actually becomes quite dangerous so it's got there's, there's really two faces to this prison there's the the the, the village the south american village during the day mm. women in their colorful skirts you know bolivians are just there's such a colorful um beautiful pure culture and then at night time they a lot of the middle class sections let's call them lock their gates because at night time is when all the people start smoking cocaine base which is similar to crack cocaine and mm. then they really start to go a little bit crazy alcohol drugs violence you know they'll be up all night partying so um, we actually did the one hour tour he took us back to his prison cell and we started talking and his stories were just so amazing like i've never heard anything like this mm. He's not highly educated, so I was like, you should write a book. And he's like, oh, you know, like, I'm not a very good writer. And uh, Simone suggested, said, look, Rusty is a good writer, but he hasn't got a story. So I was a writer who didn't have a story, and he had a story, <laughs> and he needed a writer. So that was kind of how we met. Yeah. That's, um, I think, was, well, going through that tour, did you ever feel a sense of, I guess, apprehension or feel that you were at risk or anything like that? Or was... Was Thomas just sort of making it sort of feel that it was 
a comfortable environment. I mean, you mentioned yeah. there's two fat, there's two sides to yeah. the prison day. And not, so not the not. first thing is, you know, he's a really engaging person. He looks you in the eye, shakes your hand. He remembered everyone's name. He's got a beautiful voice. He's just a charming individual. Not at all like what my preconception of drug traffic as well. I was thinking he's going to be like a, a hard, untrustworthy, you know, violent criminal, but he's not. Um, he also had a bodyguard with him, which that was, that was an unnecessary, but it was a precaution that made you feel a lot safer. So this big sort of six foot three guy mm. uh, following us around. He'd been stabbed five times. No one was messing with him. He'd survived being stabbed five times through the gut. And so th there was no danger. You know, the the tourists were bringing a lot of money into the prison economy and they need money circulating inside there to to survive so providing the tourists were respectful they weren't allowed to bring cameras providing they're respectful they would spend money at the restaurants they would buy handicrafts buy medicine for the inmates blankets you know give the kids coloring in kits so for providing you know it was done respectfully the inmates were really very very um you know, very calm and there was no danger like at all. Welcoming of it. Yeah, very well. well. Some some of them didn't like it, but they just stayed out of the way, right? Yeah. Um, at night time, as I said, that was a different place. So most tourists who went in there only went in for the one hour tour. The visitor's bell rang and he said, well, it's a nice meeting. You got to go. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to go. Like, this is the most amazing <laughs> thing ever. And he's like, well, if you give me an extra $5 each, you can spend the night. And I looked at my girlfriend and she's like, I'm staying. And I'm like, you can't stay. You're you know, attractive 24 year old girl. <laughs> and, and she's like, well, you're staying, I'm staying. And so we ended up staying two nights in the prison and we had quite a few beers by the second end of the second night. And I, I nodded off and I woke up and when I woke that the Simone and Thomas said, guess what? You're writing a book. And I went, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> so was it a case of going going away and sort of working out the logistics behind and then coming back in? Because you were there for three or four months. Yeah, so that was the first two nights. And then there was six months break before I went back because, you know, we had planned a, a tour and I wasn't going to suddenly stop traveling with my girlfriend just because I wanted to write a book. It was like, I need some time to think about this. Um, we stayed in contact. We kept traveling through... Um, Peru and Ecuador came back to Australia I worked for six months in the legal industry and you know by that, by that stage I was you know you're back in comfortable Sydney sun shining I'm like why would I you know it started to seem a bit like a bit of a dream like that that was a crazy place do I really want to do this with my life give up a good job you know an office uh, career and I was like, actually, yeah, I do. I think I'd be end up. I would have ended up suicidal if I'd stayed in, you know, corporate world. <laughs> um, so I went back, and then I, at that stage, there was no definite time period in mind. It was just go back and do the research, stay in the prison for a while. And I was thinking, you know, two weeks, three weeks, but it actually ended up being four months because Thomas had another legal case, so we had to wait to get him out and had to wait for his trial to come up. So, going in there as a tourist on that on that tour, yeah. Um, versus you going in there and staying there for a yeah. period of time i'm sure that the response from the locals in that that area was very different yeah you're right i mean basically you became i became like one of them you know they kind of accepted me obviously it wasn't a prisoner so i could come and go i had an apartment on the outside and some days you know if it got too much you know we're living in a thomas had a, a nice room but i was sleeping on the floor and so if every now and then if we were, you know, just wanted some, some time out from each other, I would go out of the prison and I could do whatever I want. But, you know, the inmates all knew me. You, they learn your name, you learn their names, you meet their kids. So it sort of like became, I was never a prisoner. I never had that psychological insight into, mm. to, to feeling what it was like to be incarcerated. But it definitely had a big influence on the book in terms of authenticity because, yeah. you know, when you hear about this, crazy prison system, alcohol, drugs, women, restaurants, you know, um, there's parties in there. They have, they have rock bands in there actually, Andy. <laughs> Maybe there's an opportunity oh, for man. your I've been waiting to tour South America yeah. for so many years. Can so we give you a band to plug? What we, let's, let's <laughs> <laughs> insert music now. Insert, insert Andy Dowling music. <laughs> um, yeah, so it does sound like a bit of a, you know, not like a prison. It sounds like yeah. too light, but it's actually, you know, prison is prison. And once you, you know, boredom's the main thing you face, boredom, frustration, just the days tick on. And by the end, I was just desperate to leave, but I couldn't leave because I had to get Thomas out. Yeah. And there's no way I could have published this book ethically if he'd still been in there because there could have easily been reprisals against him. Absolutely. And did you feel being a foreigner, so to speak, um, had any disadvantage being um, in there? I'd say it has, a, has an advantage, you know, um, for whatever reason, perhaps because of their Spanish colonial history, South Americans tend to um, be 
overly respectful i'd say almost like look up to white people there you know you, you, they're used to it's almost like a if you're a white tourist there you're you're not going to get in much trouble you know the, the police won't put you in prison they just don't mess with you so you're in a really privileged position going through south america as a white person well i had a thought um the other day because i started reading your new book and i was thinking about the stereotypes that a lot of south american countries have with the drug culture and and some of the you know with the, the militias and mm -hmm. violence and the dangerous aspects and when i talk to friends and family and you talk about traveling to these parts of the world they're like oh geez don't do it and we sort of we we get sucked into that fear aspect of it mm. well, but with, with your books i mean that's what you've highlighted these yeah. stereotypes but i mean obviously it's a reality it's a stereotype for a reason yeah there's i mean that's a that's a good point you've made i mean i absolutely i love bolivia and i also love colombia even more i, I think it's colombia in particular is an amazing culture beautiful landscapes wonderful people they're such happy resilient people yeah very optimistic colombians have consistently rated as either the first or second happiest nation in the world despite <laughs> all the tragedy and uh suffering that they've been through and i really wanted to write a book that did justice to the to the people and their spirit but but neither can you overlook the incredible human rights abuses the violence the cocaine trafficking obviously to an extent i i guess i'm exploiting the negative stereotypes but i i'd like to think my ambition is also to use that as a i guess as a draw card for readers wanting to know about war militia uh child soldiers cocaine trafficking those are those are our salacious prurient interests in in south america but there's so much more depth there so i think hopefully those are the things that attract people to begin reading but when they come out of the book at the other side they've learned a great deal about colombia colombian history the reasons for the war social injustice and hopefully they feel inspired and and also begin to recognize the link between our behavior in the west in terms of drug consumption and our drug policies which have failed drastically in latin america and caused untold suffering like horrific uh, torture human rights abuses corruption uh, impediment to uh, economic development they are paying the highest price for what you know westerners um, do in terms of their the westerners are the ones who are consuming drugs and they're also the ones prosecuting the war on drugs so it's a kind of a contradiction for south americans who in general i mean obviously the prison being one exception but colombians all the colombians i know don't take cocaine in fact most of them have never even seen it and yet it's the drug which has absolutely decimated their their country so there's a real sad irony there that colombia ha is known you know in news headlines for a kidnap for cocaine and for its uh, brutal 50-year war which has just ended this year thankfully um so those are the things that i guess negative news always travels yeah. makes better headlines makes uh you know tr travels faster so that's all we ever hear when there's mm. a positive news story about colombia it doesn't tend to make no. uh, the headlines ex <laughs> with the exception of this peace accord which is wonderful i mean so the war in colombia started in around the mid mid 60s with a communist guerrilla and then about the 70s and particularly through the 80s and 90s we had their their opposition terrorist organization called the paramilitaries or the alta defensas yep. and then you've got the central government and then the american you the u.s government came in there so there was really four sides to this war this horrific war that that raged on for decades and uh yeah they signed a peace pact with the insurgents earlier this year and the farc guerrilla have handed their weapons in and the current president juan manuel santos was awarded the nobel peace prize earlier this year so there's hopefully a happy ending it's at least a, a you know silver lining to to the dark clouds in colombia it's um i know a few people that have traveled uh through colombia and uh especially musicians playing playing shows all through mm -hmm. south america and um i think going back to what you said before about uh, i guess the white foreigner and the perception from locals and the way that those tourists are treated um they had nothing but positive positive experiences from it and i think and it's probably like anywhere in the world really i mean if you look for trouble you'll, you'll find, find it, it. <laughs> exactly and look you know it's an unfortunate thing that you know there is now a big boom in um, cocaine tourism throughout mm -hmm. south america a lot of people just go over there you know because it costs whatever three four hundred dollars a gram in australia 
um, and then you can get it for you know five dollars on the street there and there's a lot of people go there just to do that um, mm. but there's so much more to these cultures and but you're right there's lots of um, lots of bands are going into Colombia in fact what they don't play here anymore but men at work have been oh, yeah. touring Bolivia for the last like 30 years that's like one of their biggest fan bases really? in Bolivia I didn't even realize yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. Like, like, I'm like men at work <laughs> land down under <laughs> <laughs> of all the places yeah it's incredible um okay so the period of time that you're writing um or you'd been at the prison in bolivia mm -hmm. and then after that it ended and yep. everything had been resolved mm -hmm. you went you moved to, moved to, to Colombia, Colombia, and then you started yeah. writing correct so I, I moved to Colombia mainly because we you know i wanted to stay around the latin american culture and sort of maintain my inspiration also thomas didn't have a passport so he couldn't leave the continent and we needed to, we needed jobs because we'd spend all our money i'd you know we had to bribe thomas out of the prison borrow money my two credit cards were maxed out my parents were paying off just the interest alone was huge so i was going further and further into debt but i needed to be able to support myself whilst writing the book so i got a job as an english teacher at first learned spanish and became a sort of translator so i was up up at night times translating newspapers or embassy documents and working during the day as a you know a as an English uh, teacher. So it wasn't until after you, what, once you moved to Colombia that you started learning Spanish then? Um, no, I, I mean, obviously they speak Spanish uh, throughout the continent, um, with the exception of uh, Brazil where they speak Portuguese and some mm. other French speaking little pockets. Um, but no, I, I'd learned, I took a few classes and then obviously traveling around the first time for four or five months, I could speak but to speak fluently yeah. only once I reached Colombia and really, because there weren't that many foreigners there and so they don't all speak English. So, and you know, you just, if you want to get a job, if you want to fit into a culture, you've got to learn the local language. That's Absolutely. the only way you can truly understand the culture is the first step is learning language. Um, segue, uh, tangent again. Segway. <laughs> um, I was reading up about the, the Australian that was caught earlier this year in Colombia yep. who's going through the courts at the moment. Yep. And I saw that you had been referenced in an article and you made <laughs> a comment about, um, and not to go too deeply into it, but yep. there's one, one little aspect that you mentioned that was quite interesting where about public perception and being in the media and making a lot of noise and having people talk about it all the time and the headlines popping up. But the yep. other thing was for her to actually learn Spanish. Yeah, definitely. That's your that's your best uh, you know that's your best defense against against um, and also the best way you're going to pass the time easily. It's incredibly intimidating to be locked up in a prison where you can't speak the language. You don't know what's going on around you. You haven't got any friends there. Family's a long way away. So that's definitely that would be my first recommendation to the young Australian who's been caught in Colombia for attempting to smuggle out you know five point eight kilograms. Um, I've done, yeah, I would have done about 25 media appearances just from that. <laughs> I because unfortunately, I don't, know, I don't know if it's a good thing, but, you know, I'm, I'm now the, the go-to guy. Whenever anything about Colombia and cocaine comes up, the media call me. You're the, <laughs> so you're the Western subject matter I, expert. You know, I went from wanting to be, you know, I'm private school upbringing, wanting to be a playwright to I am the, you know, I'm the cocaine guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pigeonholing myself a bit here, Andy. Yeah. No, that's okay. Everyone's <laughs> going to have their niche. Um, is, it, is it a case that even from a perception point of view and – sort of local or cultural respect if you're making an attempt to learn the language and trying to get a grasp of it that it gives you not that it gives you a clear advantage but obviously from a perception point of view it's demonstrating good behavior yeah look i i travel the world a lot and i always at a minimum at a minimum even if you're in the country for two days you know to learn how to say please and thank you and hello and goodbye it's not that hard yeah and it's just making an effort i, I really bristle when i see foreigners you know, in different countries being disrespectful and going, oh, you know, can't you speak English? And they just walk in and speak English. It's just a, a, a natural assumption that they're, that our language and our culture is superior and they should learn our language. It's like, hang on, we're in their country. That's like right. learn, learn a little, at least learn the minimum, learn, learn some basics just, just to make the effort, you know, and people, people open up a yeah. lot more when you just even just learn a few words. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I see Hola. that. I see that. Um, I've seen that over the years, in particular, I was in Barcelona last year and, we're in the port, and uh, a lot of a lot of Brits come in on the on the cruise ships. Oh yeah! And we made the mistake of going to one of the restaurants right on the on the water there, which is right. pretty much it's just a the tourist trip. area. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just to overhear some of the conversations from people at the tables uh, trying to order something, and then you know the Brits. And I might be a bit unfair, but stereotypically don't have the most uh, adventurous. Uh, uh, palette for food at times. I think it depends. You know, Spain. Uh, you know, Spain's obviously an easy, just an easy destination for for British travellers. In fact, there was a survey 
and 69% of British people said they'd rather live in Spain. Now, I don't know why they don't move down there because they're so close, <laughs> only like an hour flight. So, you, look, you do get you do get a uh, different class of tourists going uh, close to home. But uh, in my experience, British are great travelers and Canadians and Australians. And it just depends, you know, it just depends where you are. If, if you're just going to a, a resort, then, you know, you don't always get the people who are really wanting to find out about the culture they just want you know they want some sun they want some booze and then they want to go back home so yeah, but few, it, the, you know if you're there. traveling to go and live in a culture understand the culture immerse yourself in the culture you avoid those tourist places like the plague you know i you know i'm really happy that columbia is now on the map big time for tourism i think when i was there there were only about like a thousand or so tourists going through a year because it was considered to be so dangerous so we had we felt that we had the, the country to ourselves and the colombians when they when they saw us they're like what are you doing here like this is dangerous and i'm like this is amazing this is an awesome country and they were so friendly and now when i go back i went back last year uh, to do a documentary called Wildlands, and I just it was packed. There was the, when I went there, it was, there was one hostel in La Candelaria, and now there's 53 in this one suburb. And you know, when you feel like, and of course, it's very subjective, but when you go to a country and so for your first time, you feel like you've discovered that country. Of course, yeah. it's been there for centuries, but you go, it's kind of you, you feel a sense of um, ownership almost. And then when you see other people there, you go, oh, you shouldn't be here. You're just a tourist, right? <laughs> Which is, a, it's a total, a total hypocrisy, double standard. But yeah, when I see people just flooding into Colombia and going there for the drugs, you know, it's, that's really disappointing for me. Oh, I, f I find that with, uh, with Japan, the first time that we went there, 15 odd years ago and for 10 days that we were there we saw one other caucasian person in that entire time and we went through the three major cities and um it was incredible we and we stood out and everyone was we'd never experienced hospitality like the japanese mm. and everyone's really courteous and everyone would just go out of their way for you even if they didn't want to yeah. they demonstrated that that helpfulness and then the consecutive years that went past there and in Australia opening that or Japan opening the doors and cheap flights over there and whatnot yeah. every year you went back you just saw more and more and yeah. more and more Australians and you're like oh get out of here it's a it's a double, total double standard it it? Is. because we are we are still tourists right yeah. but you sort of feel like oh we're because you're more you might know a bit more about the culture you've been there before that you kind of have the right to be there but other tourists don't yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, but yeah I mean there's parts of Africa and, and Asia as well where they just you know that they, 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 they see a white see white skin they just come from touch you or they come and just follow you or stare at you, you know. This uh, it's really weird when they haven't seen a white person ever, and they're just looking at you, going, "Wow, blue eyes!" It's like an alien. This <laughs> yeah, is incredible. It's, it's an incredible experience as well. You feel like you're, you know, like an yeah. You feel like you're an extraterrestrial. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you actually own a, a place over in Colombia now? <laughs> I've still got a house over there. Yeah. Um, when I was leaving, I really wanted to do something nice for the country. And 10% um, of my royalties from Colombiano go to helping children affected by violence to a foundation called the Colombian Children's Foundation. You can find that online at colombianchildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrenschildrensch
and working with the US. Yeah, so and I was this is sort of leading into. Mm, so I, uh, Martini Columbia. Powder came out June two thousand three, and I went back to Colombia. By that stage, I you know I was in love with the country. I thought it was just amazing. I just said, "This is this is my home. This is my spiritual home. I found my passion, my inspiration. I really wanted to write another book, and it was going to be about Colombia." I didn't yet know the exact focus, but I went back to continue working as an English teacher just to get some money yeah. through the door and and just to start interviewing people. I was writing little vignettes and just trying to work out what, what exactly I want to write about. On one of my flights back into the country through Miami, I met a guy in an airport who was in his late 40s. Uh, he was wearing a suit and tie. He was he didn't speak Spanish, and I was like, "What are you doing going down to Colombia?" <laughs> he sort of looked a bit suspicious, <laughs> and he he claimed that he was in construction. Oh, and yeah. he was a lovely guy, and he's become a really good friend and mentor to me. And he this is you know, that meeting with Thomas, that one hour tour with Thomas um, changed my life, like it t totally changed my life. And this was the second time this has happened to me in such a big way. So this guy on the plane, and we beca we became friends. He took me out to dinner a few times. We had a few beers, and then he sort of said well, you know, why are you an English teacher? You know, you've got a law degree, a commerce degree. Why don't you, you know, come work for us? And I was like, doing what? And he said, well, get up at six o'clock tomorrow morning and I'll pick you up. And he picked me up in a bulletproof car and took me to a, <laughs> a, a U.S. counterterrorism base that was under construction um, um, in Colombia. And he said, we do construction, but we just construct you know, counterterrorism bases. <laughs> so uh, rifle ranges, uh, pistol ranges, shoot house, um, all the uh, accommodation, um, all the logistics and camp management for counterterrorism bases around the world. And they needed someone to be their program manager. So the program itself was called um, AKI, which is Anti-Kidnapping Initiative. Uh, Colombia, unfortunately, had the, um, the dubious reputation, uh, the dubious um, honor of being the country with the highest kidnap rate in the world. So. Mm. Uh, at the peak, there were between three and four thousand kidnaps per year, and that that averages out to about eight or nine, sometimes ten people per day. And you can imagine, just even if one person were kidnapped in Absolutely. in Australia or UK or wherever or the US, that would be national headlines. But you know, there were just so many that that it was just became normalised and desensitised, and you know, the population was living in fear that people wouldn't use the roads at night time. Wealthy people would live in gated communities. Uh, High-rise apartments always had um, guards with guns down down the stairs and CCTV everywhere. So it was a real fortress mentality when I was there. Um, and this program aimed to change that. So they used special forces, people from the US military, uh, um, contractors essentially, and from the British uh, military as well, SAS. And they came down and they trained up um, and equipped and armed the local uh, SWAT teams that were, you know, they were very, very already very experienced and professional soldiers, but they lacked, um, they lacked the advanced weaponry. So that was one and the advanced training. So that was what the program was about. There were 32 um, departments, departamentos or provinces in Colombia. Each of them has one of these local SWAT teams um, dedicated to stopping kidnaps and extortion so we were you know sort of f financing them equipping them giving them uniforms bullets grenades explosives and training what was your reaction when you walked in and realized what what this all was uh, i freaked out i was like <laughs> oh, is this a trap like why me what have i done here am i this am i being set up for something i just you know but i mean the guy was really not this gentleman was a really nice guy and you know, I trusted him, and he he put a lot of faith in me because I was 28 at the time, so I was pretty young to be in that area. And obviously, and I was you know in a management position at the age of 28 around you know experienced soldiers, mm. and um, it was it was the best job I've ever had. And I really you know at first I had a bit of a dilemma going, well, this is U.S. government, it's a military. I'm you know I'm generally a, a fairly peaceful person, and I certainly I, like, I mean <laughs> the world would be to my mind the world would be a great place if no guns ever existed. But unfortunately, you know, when you have terrorist organizations trying to overthrow a central government, you you know that's the only you have to defend yourself. So, and when I saw what this particular program was doing, which was rescuing people who were who had been chained in the jungle by the neck and held in barbed wire cages, try you know forced to trek around the jungle so that they the government couldn't rescue them, uh, fed on a diet of rice and beans and lentils and you know deprived of sunlight and, and medical care and no contact with their loved ones you know just and not knowing what their fate would be that's just such a horrific um inhumane crime again it's just one of the most debased things that you can do in, as a human and 
you know, basically the, this program, along with other government, Colombian government initiatives backed by the US, really turned the country around and kidnaps are down to, on average, one a day now. It's still one too many, but it um, it made a massive difference. You know, to, it doesn't matter whether you're pro-US or you know, communist, or it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't think it matters what your politics are. There's just no justification to my mind for kidnapping people and, and holding a gun to the head and saying, how much do you want to pay for your loved one back? So... I was, you know, I'm really, I was skeptical at first and a little bit apprehensive, but ultimately quite proud of um, being, you know, I was only a small will in, in all this. I'm not claiming any grand um, heroism in, in all this. I was one person who was, you know, part of a big program and part of a big government initiative to really turn the country around. And, and they did that. It's a wonderful country. And as I said before, now tourists are flooding in and it's so much safer. Is Was that when you were first exposed? Well, I mean, no doubt I'm sure that you already knew about kidnappings and especially child kidnappings being sort of a highlight but um was it only when you started being exposed to this organization that you really started to understand the the reality behind it and what some of these especially the children are, are having to go through yeah so look i'd so I'd already been in the country for a few years by then obviously i read i could speak spanish i'd interviewed i already interviewed people around the world so i knew i, knew, I guess i knew a, a, quite a bit about everything in theory yeah but working you know closely with the police and military in the u.s and being around guns it really was just the closest you could get to the war without being in the war yourself yeah. so it was you know it's like really deep first-hand um first-hand re research and interviews and also the contacts that i had there gave me access to far higher level um interview subjects interviewees and I obviously knew when I first went to Colombia, I didn't know there were child soldiers in Colombia at all. In fact, uh, Human Rights Watch estimates that at the peak of the war, there were between eleven and fourteen thousand children mm. involved in the civil war. I didn't know about that. We all hear about child soldiers coming from Africa, yep. but very few people are aware that, uh, that Colombia had so many child soldiers. So I really that that became very quickly became my focus because my heart went out to these kids, and as I started interviewing them and hearing about their the horrific treatment they received in these um, terrorist organizations. I just went, look, the world needs to know about this. And I could have written it as, as journalism, as sort of dry statistics. But when you st start talking about 11, 14,000 kids or 3,000 people kidnapped per year, you, you're just overwhelmed. It's just a number. Yeah, um, and so to it. my mind, if you're writing just facts and figures and statistics, it's so dry, people lose the human element of it. And so I wanted to really write a sort of personalized um, account of, you know, from the told from the perspective of these child soldiers. It's fictionalized. It's a fiction book, Colombiano. But the factual setting and the historical period is is very accurate. Yeah, I've just started reading it, and I'm, I'm halfway through that first uh, uh, because the, there's, there's a number of stories in there I, yeah. from what I can see. So I'm on that first story and I think there's like a few chapters around that story. It's where um, the son and his father are, are and like spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> the, Chapter one, spoiler alert. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, the father and the son are burying the, far, the, the farmer yeah. and they're, they're going through all that that process and he's becoming an adult himself and then mm. he's got to it's getting to that point i think of where i've literally just ended at the moment where he's getting to a point where we realize he's got to choose a side because yeah. he's got no choice it's unfortunate you know and that's that's sort of one of the themes is you know and of this book is you know if you do, if you don't choose a side one will be chosen for you one will be picked for you um the colombian government didn't have full control over the country probably about uh, between 30 and 40 percent of the national territory of Colombia was in the hands of one or other of these terrorist organizations in fact there there are two main ones but in fact there are about four or five splinter groups and so if you're living in the areas controlled by these terrorist organizations they are the de facto government they they you do what they say or they come around and visit you with guns and they control the economy they control people's social life they control the laws effectively everyone has to live under their tyranny and you can try and oppose it, but you'll end up losing your life. So basically, you either join them or you join the opposition. And there's there's very limited scope for being neutral. There are some very brave people who maintain neutrality, but often they will become targeted just by virtue of saying, I refuse to choose a side, yeah. and they can be killed for not choosing a side. I think um, the example or 
the aspect of that first story where they're talking about the taxes mm. that need to be paid to the guerrillas mm. um, just reminds me of the Red Army in China having to go through each province and taxing the locals to mm. ensure that they've got protection or whatever it might be. Effectively, you know, it's, like, it's sort of like the mafia, right? So the... You know, because terrorist organizations are actually quite expensive to fund, you know, you got a, a standing army, the FARC at its peak was they estimate between 17 and 13, sorry, 17 and 20,000 soldiers, making it the biggest uh, standing um, insurgency in the Western Hemisphere. Imagine feeding those people, buying rifles, bullets, um, all the logist logistical aspects of keeping an army um, fed and, and moving around, they need money. And also because the government wasn't there, so the terrorist organizations would charge 10% tax on everything. And they basically, that was how they financed themselves along with, that was extortion. Kidnapping was another and cocaine trafficking was a very lucrative source of funding for them as well. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, similarities in, in a number of different countries with organizations well, with, we're seeing we're seeing very you know we're seeing that with ISIS, and one of the things with with ISIS in particular is that they are it's not just a, a political or religious movement; it's also they're highly integrated into the economy. So that's mm -hmm. it's they become actually part of the fabric of society. It's very difficult to root them out. Um, yeah, so Colombia, they you had, the, had to pay ten percent. It's a vacuna; they call it a vaccination, but effectively it was a tax. And their, their argument, they had some pretty logical arguments, and it was, we are providing protection. We are, we are, we are the de facto government. If the government were here, they would be charging you taxes. So we're just charging you taxes, taxes if we're the government. <laughs> so that was their kind of opportunists. That, that was their rationale. But you, yeah. know, you see that same rationale by standover groups and mafias, and the Italian mafia always paid. We're, we're protect. We're pa you're paying us money to. Protect protect you but in fact you're really just paying the money to protect you from them <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, and it's such a foreign thing for people like us living yeah. living in sydney and australia in the western world for well for the most part where we we're not really exposed to a lot of well that. we don't realize how lucky we are you know when you see you know the corruption s scandal or if someone in government has taken a bribe or a policeman has been involved in drug trafficking those are really isolated incidents and those to me are, are indications that we have a wonderful government and we have a wonderful police force and a really honest society and it's good i mean it's good that obviously any corrupt incidents get exposed in the media and actions are, are taken but it's an indicator of how amazingly functional australian society is and how you know how how fair it has been historically i think it's becoming less fair and less egalitarian than 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 previously but it's still an amazingly civilized country we live in do you think as a result that we're we're a lot more disconnected from some yeah i mean we you know people i think people are geared our, our natural our brains are naturally wired to look for stress and look for problems and so when your basic needs are being met whether it's security roof over your head you start to look for new problems you know so like people facebook feed <laughs> yeah so people develop kind of anxieties about oh, am i attractive yep. you know am i successful enough um do my friends like me you know do i look good in this instagram photo these are all first world problems because we re the, the the other more uh, basic problems of, of being fed and clothed and you know, the, the difficulties, the, ba the, the satisfaction of basic needs that still plague and confront other developing nations just aren't present in our lives. So we're like, oh, this is the most important thing right now. I want to be seen in this nightclub or sipping a soy latte at this cafe. Look at me. And, uh, you know, there's a whole set of anxieties that we invent for ourselves because we're not really struggling. Did, was that ever a conflict for you coming from, I guess, your upbringing and living here and knowing that, I guess there was a better life, so to speak, where you had the comforts at home and you could always go back there, but you were putting yourself through that adversity too. Mm, yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it's kind of seems like a perverse thing to do, but I actually feel a lot more alive when I'm around that dynamic. And I think you, you see a lot more extremes of human behavior. And that's always, I've always been fascinated by people, but I think, you know, wealth and, so yeah, but essentially wealth and civilization um, can provide a kind of a mask or a buffer for, for what we're really like. So when you see, I know when I, I, I feel more passion and inspiration living in countries where where people are struggling and they it brings out different sides of your character. It's you know it's ironical as I said before that you know say Australia has a quite a high suicide rate given our material wealth mm. and countries like Colombia actually have low suicide rates and as I said consistently rate as the happiest countries in the world. So it's kind of a perverse facet of human society that when you're struggling 
with basic things, you're actually, you haven't got time to invent problems for yourself. You know, you haven't got problems to go, why am I here? You haven't got the existentialist angst and going, oh, who am I? I'm a failure. They don't think about those things in those countries. They're just struggling to stay alive. Yeah, it's... um. Yeah, it's such a disconnect for so many people. I mean, I'm, I'm like that myself. And even coming here today, thinking, what do I know about South America? I've never been there. What do I know about, uh, you know, that, that drug culture and the cartels and, and the, the, uh, the guerrilla armies and the child soldiers and the kidnappings? And so for me, I'm an outsider. Yeah. For you, you know more and you've had exposure to it, but then you probably felt like that as an outsider to them as well. Yeah, exactly. And look, and obviously I was flitting between, flicking between the, the two cultures. Like when I, it takes me a while to readjust when I go to Colombia and reintegrate there. And then I come back to, you know, beautiful Mossman in Sydney yeah. and go, wow, it's a culture shock. And, then, and I love both. I love both sides, but it, it's amazing how in one planet there are just so many different cultures and different ways of living and it's always a bit of a shock when you flip from one to the next. I bet. I love traveling for that reason. You, know, you just get such a broad um, understanding of, of, of humans because we're all essentially the same. We all essentially want the same things. Basic but needs. The, yeah. yeah, but the basic needs, you want, you know, you want love, you want, you want recognition, you want friendship, you want, uh, you know, you want to achieve your goals. And, that, and those are universal things. And yet it plays out in just dramatically different um uh, dynamics around the world in different cultures. Yeah, it's incredible. It's definitely something that keeps you on your toes, and and that feeling of being outside your comfort zone. I mean, I've 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 seen I've felt that so many times being somewhere and just going, do I do I walk out the front door today? Like you, huh. you just that you got that apprehension where you just you know that you're going to have to have not so much a difficult conversation, but a frustrating conversation with somebody because of a language gap or a yeah. cultural gap or, you know, where do I eat? Mm. And those, those things that are so tri trivial and might seem petty, but they're, it's a, it's a human challenge to try and overcome initially mm. because you're, you're literally outside of your comfort zone. Well, that's, that's part of the reason I love traveling is to kind of, you, you, you actually learn a lot about yourself and, you, and you're challenging yourself constantly. You're constantly learning. But I think, you know, sometimes in, in Western societies, we have things too easy and that actually can breed discontent and boredom, you know? And so that was, that was my primary, I guess, feeling growing up was there's got to be more to life than, than what, the, even though I had so much, yeah. I wasn't necessarily happy with it. And it wasn't until I went to, you know, poorer nations, developing nations where they were facing an entirely different gamut of, um, uh, uh, entirely different problems that I went, wow, I'm actually really, really lucky. And I learned <laughs> perspective. To, yeah. I've got different perspective. Yeah. I learned to appreciate what I had, whereas I didn't when I was, when I was growing up with such privileges. Yeah, definitely. Um, so going back to starting this, this work with, uh, as a, as a contractor yeah. and, and working with, uh, these, these, these us, uh, this us program to mm -hmm. sort of upskill and provide training for, for Colombian, uh, soldiers military, or military? military military and police yeah um how far along in that process did you actually because i know that you said when you're going back to columbia you wanted to write something and you yeah. didn't know what it was did you have that light bulb moment almost straight away that you go i know what i need to write about or was that something that sort of came later on down the track as you immerse yourself into that well into i was just re i was or even before i started working for the you know this program i was already uh, interviewing loads of people, you know, involved around, uh, in and around the war. I thought that this is a, this is what the, it's basically impossible to write something about Colombia without, uh, the context of the war. Cause it, it just permeated everyone's life for, for, for decades, for five decades. So I was already interviewing people. And then obviously the angle and my perspective changed quite dramatically when I was, you know, started looking at it from the, the army side. I probably would have written a completely different story and perhaps one which is less empathetic if I just looked at it from an outsider's point of view. You, you, maybe I would take the side and say, these guys are definitely the bad guys. But when you start talking to one side and then you start speaking to the other side, you begin to gain an understanding that there's, you know, it's a, so much more complex. You know, it's, I won't say there's no right or wrong, but there's certainly... Um, different ways of looking at the same issues and it's not until you try to understand as many perspectives as you as you can that you can write a decent book I think with some depth some, and some real understanding and was that one of the reasons why you chose to go down that fiction 
fictional path? Yeah, like, I mean, there was a practical issue as well, and that was that most people were really scared and they wouldn't go on the record and they yeah. certainly wouldn't give their names and they wouldn't give permission f- to write a book about them or to, mm. to mention them in a book because they were afraid of rep- reprisals. So I had it would be difficult to write a non-fiction book about someone who was anonymous. And also there were just so many interviewees whose stories I wanted to include um, and who's, you know, who's, I wanted to weave them all together, but they didn't know each other. They weren't necessarily connected in, in real life. So it might be meet one person in one part of the country who had an amazing story and then another person in another part of the country that had a different story a different period of time. So how do you combine all these anonymous stories um into and try and give it an identity and, and give and, and give it you know give it a story arc something mm. that's going to drive it along and make people want to read and if i'd just kept to these little vignettes it would have been very very disjointed so with the help of simone camilleri who was my then girlfriend she's now uh, my literary agent and story consultant I was going to ask you about the story consultant. I think yeah. That's an interesting title. Yeah. Well, most people don't understand how books get written. Yeah. Um, fiction in particular, I found really challenging. But mm. so nonfiction, obviously, you're you're limited uh, to the telling the truth. You have to you have to stick to the facts. Yeah. And that, that might sound frustrating, but actually, in some ways, makes it easier because you you can't ve- you can't deviate. Whereas, not, uh, fiction, on the other hand. You know, you have to use your imagination. You have to go to the limits. Yet, and so story consultants are, are quite common for writers, in particularly script writers in in Hollywood, and basically the people who help you tease out a story, identify weaknesses in the storyline, develop characters. So Simone was really instrumental, for example, in saying, "Well, what about females' perspective?" You know, so my character, my female characters tended to be fairly flat, one-dimensional. Mm. You know, the mother, the the girlfriend. And we didn't really, I didn't really delve into their perspective. And she yeah. really said, well, how, how, how do you think his girlfriend feels? How do you think his mother feels? Why don't you put her emotions in there? So story consultants are really valuable if you can, if you can find a good one, yeah. um, you know, and Simone was really incredible. She didn't you know, she worked for free at the time, basically. And just as a friend, because she believed in my talent and really helped develop me as a writer. Is that the first time that you've dived into sort of fictional writing or have you had cracks at it before um so my, obviously my first book was marching powder i'd never attempted a, a piece that long i'd written short stories at school and at university i won one or two sort of small prizes you know the new south wales university literary prize so i knew i could write okay but there's a big difference mm. between um writing a sh- you know a thousand page or sorry a thousand word uh, essay or a thousand thousand word short story and writing a novel that's you know this one's like 200 200 and something thousand words you know, yeah, it's, it's a it's a thick book yeah it's, it's, a, it's, it's a brick it's an <laughs> it's a multicolored brick andy <laughs> that's what i call it but uh luckily it's got quite big font so people shouldn't be turned off just by the size of it you know you can get through it and hopefully this the pace sustains your interest and that's it i mean it doesn't matter the length or the size of the book it's whether it's interesting and whether the whether the pace pulls you along and whether yeah. you want to find out what comes next. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so from sitting down, obviously you spent a long time collating information and interviewing people and trying to get, even to begin with, before you got your angle, um, investing a lot of time getting that content together. But mm-hmm. the point where you sat down and, and had all this content and tried to sort of mash it together and work out how it's going to be structured how long was that was that process before you had that first draft together uh the first draft the first draft of this story i mean actually uh, the original original book was uh three times as long and it had three (laughs) three different stories let's call them um um a b and c and it was i was like i'm never going to get this book done i was way too ambitious i didn't didn't really know how to limit the scope so i started concentrating on the c book and the first draft of that was completed in about 2012. Um, but overall, from research and to this final book hitting the shelves, you know, it had been 12, 13 years, which is a long time to be staring at a computer screen, a long time to keep yourself motivated. I didn't have, you know, there's no one patting you on the back. There's no one looking over your shoulder going, yeah, what you're doing is good. There's no, you know, the, I didn't have a deadline. So, you know, for a long time, I really felt I was sort of lost out, lost out at sea. And then yeah. luckily, Simone in particular was really instrumental, as was uh, the as were the editors and staff at Random House. I guess that would have been 
probably a big driver because I just think about anything that I do and if I can't see the end goal within like a short space of time, I lose, I lose focus. You lose perspective, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, and also I got, I got rather depressed as well because you're just like, you, I, I assumed, you know, wow, I had an international bestseller with my first book. It took about a year or well, four months to research and about a year to write. So I was like, you know, I can do this. I've done it the first time. I've done it once. This is going to be easy. Yeah. And I did not envisage that I would be 42 when my book came out. I thought I'd, you know, I started it in my 30s. It, it took out, it took my entire 30s to write this. This was a, a, a decade project, decade long project. I can't, even, I can't even wrap my head mm. around that. But I mean, that's that. I always crap on to, to friends about delayed gratitude. <laughs> and Delayed and gratification. That's, yeah. yeah, that's it. Gratification. And, yep. um, and I think that's a that's an extreme example of that. It is, and look, you know, my gratification levels are pretty high now because <laughs> I'm, you know, it's actually, you know, I guess I'm proud of having finished it, and but I'm just more than anything, I'm just relieved, Andy. Like you just, it ended up started off as an inspiration and then became towards the end it became a burden to me like a real like how am i going to get this done and what if i don't get it done and what if people don't like it imagine spending 10 years of your life doing something and then at one stage the publisher said this is unpublishable and that as i was like what i've spent 10 years doing something and it's, it's never gonna it's never going to see the light of day you imagine how depressing that is how it's just an absolute shock to me i went into a tailspin when they gave me that first feedback they said we, we can't publish this and um then luckily, you know, we Simone came along and the editors came along at Random House and really helped me chop it into shape. But even then, it still took another another year or two to, to get it finished. So I, I read somewhere, there was an article where you mentioned that you were working like 16 hours a day at one point. Mm. Um, I don't know at what stage of the book, but did you have routines in place to try and keep yourself going? Or yeah, was definitely. Or just dive in? Yeah, definitely. So the point where I was, I mean, I, I, gen, I think you've only got maybe, look, maximum four, five, six, if you're lucky, creative hours in a day. But not all of writing is creative. Some of it's sort of housekeeping stuff and rev revision. The point where I was doing 16, 18 hour days was because I was working on a documentary at the same time and yep. I had a deadline for both of them. So I was just literally seven days a week up for 18 sometimes 20 hours a day and i was just a zombie you know she started uh smoking you know e-cigarettes and stuff just to <laughs> just to keep myself awake and it's um yeah look it's it's most of writing i say more than skill or intelligence or talent is self-discipline you know it's basically forcing yourself to get up and sit in front of a computer screen on your own and draw you know creativity out of your brain and so it's it's an incredibly different thing difficult thing to do day after day after day and and to re re retain your inspiration i have nothing but the utmost respect for it the other writers who perhaps write more commercial stuff but release a book every year i'm like i hats off to you people i mean i don't read um the more commercial writers uh, I think, you know, I liked, I'd much rather write, you know, two or three really good books in my lifetime yeah. and that's it. But the people who can just put out a book every year, that's incredible discipline. Oh, it's just, yeah, it, um, I think just even, like I look at, um, you know, I, I have this ongoing fascination about being a drawer or a sketch, a sketch artist and being able to create something visually. And I start it and it's crap. Mm -hmm. And I chuck the pad off to the side and the pen's over in, in, a, in a basket somewhere. And yeah. then I come back six months later and then that's... Do it again. Yeah. And it, was, um, it must be days like that where you start off and you, whatever you're writing, it's just like, oh my God, this is just... This is it. So basically, uh, Ernest Hemingway said, the first draft of anything is shit, <laughs> right? <laughs> so if you'd seen, like, I'd say Colombiano is probably on its fifth iteration, like its fifth draft. Yeah to get to that standard. And if I look back at the first draft, which I thought was good at the time, I go, geez, that was terrible. So it really is a, a, a case of, doesn't matter even if you're having a bad day and what you're writing is crap and it will always be the crap the first time. Yeah. You just got to keep writing. You've just got to keep producing that material because the, the alternative is to go, I won't write unless I'm writing really well. And then you produce nothing. And a lot of people sort of have, have it in them that they want to write a book and they go, uh, you know, keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. But you just got to get and just produce something every day, even if it's even if it's low quality, and then just improve it, improve it, improve it. Well, I think um, I think you're a prime example of somebody that's just stuck to it, and there's no. It's a it's the old cliche. It's a marathon, not oh, a sprint or, or a race. It's just it's an um, absolute marathon. This has been yeah. This has just been the <laughs> it's been the love of my life and the bane of my existence, Andy. So it's, uh, I'm glad oh. to have come through it. And I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I just want to oh, sleep gonna... sleep for a month. I think. <laughs>
I was going to ask that. I mean, I, I, I think you must be still in the whirlwind of obviously launching the book and yeah. and getting around the country and whatnot. Are you doing international stuff as well? Or? Yeah. So I'm, I mean, we're going to. The aim is to release it in the UK, the US, and hopefully get it translated. Um, in the meantime, as I mentioned, I was doing a documentary called Wildlands. Oh, that yeah. was five months full time. It's an amazing, amazing documentary. Is that by, out now? It's an amazing documentary by a guy called Colin Offland. Yeah. Um, he's the director. He's a really good guy, and we teamed up, and I was the narrator presenter and we went around interviewing some fascinating characters in mm. South America and the US and that should come out in the next few weeks and that's yeah, that's international as well that's going into I think 11 foreign languages yeah. so that that will be around the world and I saw the trailer know, for that it yeah it's really out good. of control like it really is amazing I, I love I love Who's that hitman guy that you, you yeah like so the most dangerous person in South America or no something I wouldn't quite or, say that there's I mean he or one of them yeah he was Pablo Escobar's uh, chief assassin and he oh. was um he was just got out of prison and he um but was responsible for killing 3,000 people 3,000 and these guys I mean this is the Medellin cartel under Pablo Escobar they blew up a plane with killed 110 people in an attempt to assassinate a uh, Colombian presidential candidate who wasn't even on the plane then but they just blew the plane up anyway uh, <laughs> they were they killed thousands of police uh, just horrific tortures and this guy was you know in amongst the thick of it and he was he was he was a cold-blooded killer I interviewed him I interviewed uh, the guy played by Johnny Depp in the movie blow yeah if you remember remember that, remember that yep. movie from 1996 his name's George Young so he was one of the primary importers of, of cocaine for the Medellin cartel into the um, west coast of, of um, the United States, into into California, essentially. Um, and he was just out of prison. I interviewed him. I interviewed Thomas McFadden, the guy yep. from Marching Powder. We went back inside the prison mm. uh, 15 years later as older men. Jeez. And, and sort of a, bit of a uh, bit of a time warp. It was surreal. Um, yeah. The tours have now been... Tours have now been banned, right? After he left, it all sort of collapsed. And obviously, Marching Powder exposed it and the government mm. sort of shut, mainly shut it down. I do hear from time to time of, of tourists getting in there, but there are no, no sort of formal tours anymore. Yeah. We went into the prison and the only inmates who were still there were the ones who were in for murder. <laughs> so they recognized us. Yeah. And we were, we were sort of trying to keep a very low profile in, while we were filming inside illegally. Um, and then when we came out, uh, they've, they've, they've got uh, guided walking tours of uh, the city of La Paz. When we came out, there were 50 tourists standing outside the prison with a tour guide at the front pointing to the prison going, this is the prison, <laughs> San Pedro prison, made famous by Marching Powder, uh, the book by Rusty Young and Thomas McFadden. And we were just going, what? <laughs> and we actually joined this tour, like just incognito. Oh, well. Uh, we joined this tour listening to, listening to people talk about our book and our experience and just thought, what a trip, you know, two guys who met one day, you know, just friends, decided to write a book and 15 years later, the people are doing tours about it. And it's just, <laughs> you know, it's quite, it was quite a surreal experience. That's incredible. Um, just touching on, so what was the, the hitman's name? His uh, proper name is John Jairo Velasquez Vasquez and his nickname was Popeye or Popeye. And you, you personally interviewed him for that documentary? Yeah. Yeah. That was his first interview with her. I think at the time, he's now been interviewed by a few people, but that was the first, one of the first times that the, he'd been interviewed by, a, you know, a Western journalist. I think, I think there's something in the trailer about this, because I watched it a couple of months ago, but something about just the lead up to, to speaking with this guy. Oh, yeah. It just seems like there must have been some real apprehension to... Yeah, I mean, I you know I'd never met him before. Um, I knew who I knew exactly who he was, and this is this guy's killed three thousand people, right? And so I didn't know, and, and and I was like, how is he alive as well? Because if you've killed that many people, you've got a lot of enemies, and how he's got to be he's got to be keeping where he's living a secret. He's got to be on the move. He's got to be fearful of assassination. So I wasn't I wasn't fearful that he was going to do anything to me because he were, he wanted to tell his story. You know, he's now. Uh, written books and he's trying to get a I think a Netflix series up about his life um, but I was fearful that you know if I was sitting there with him in public space that someone might come around and shoot him right because how is this guy still alive you know um, so I did uh, before the interview I rang him and I was sort of said where where are we going to meet where are we going to do this and are you going to be bringing a gun <laughs> you know and I had some of my um, I'd rung some of my police contacts and said I think I might need you guys to come and 
be my bodyguards. And he yeah. had his he had his Sicario, like his you know motorbike assassins there, hanging back with guns. And we had we had our our protection there with guns, and we had all this expensive film uh, film equipment. And it obviously, it draws attention, and he's known. His face is known there because of all the crimes he's committed yeah. there. So we're filming, and everyone's looking at it. So I'm just it was it was it was hairy. And how long did that whole process take of, of doing the interview? Um, it, that we conducted that over over a day in multiple in multiple locations. We just sort of stayed on the move in in Medellin, Colombia. So um, I really got to know him pretty well, and he's you know he's a, a proper you know he was charming. He's really bright, really yeah. articulate, and really you know i won't say likable but just he's he's endearing he's really engaging speaks really quickly um and he's very direct so there's a certain charm but he's a total psychopath like he's completely unrepentant about killing people almost proud of it and you know there was a real dilemma there for me as well because you know we all like stories of you know corruption and cartels and you know violence and experiences outside our own purview but there's a risk that when you start to give people who have had you know horrific criminal backgrounds give them too much media play then you sort of make you make them into heroes yeah and that's a that's a there's a real fine line between you know journalism and exposing the story and getting to know who these people are and why they do what they do and also heroicizing their criminal acts which have caused incredible levels of suffering do you do you worry about i guess yourself and your own reputation now with having two books and the documentary and being, as you mentioned before, this person that's referred to whenever there's something that goes wrong in, in <laughs> sort of the drug drug world in South America. Do you, I mean, going back there, do you, do you ever consider? I, I, look, I won't go back to, I, I certainly won't go back to Bolivia. I, you know, sort of, um, you know, obviously I've written a controversial book about Bolivia. I'm not very popular with the government there. I think Colombia will be, won't be unsafe because they've now got the peace process has, has been um, signed off on. But you know, if you're if you're a journalist and you're and you're making statements about a country, then you you know you just want to keep a low profile for a little while and stay out of the country. I'm not fearful. I mean, I I never intended to be the kind of go-to guy for cocaine stories or cartel stories, but um, you know, I just happened to be over there at an interesting period in in the, the continent's history and Colombia's history in particular, and that was what was fascinating to me. I delved deeply into that into that world, but I'd like to use those same. Um, you know the same techniques, the same skill set to apply it to different stories, and I, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be pigeonholed as the guy who <laughs> writes about cocaine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is has anybody in Colombia uh, read in any of the books so far? Is it been? Yeah, any I've, I've had a few. I've out. had a few people who I worked with over there going because oh, they didn't. I didn't tell anyone I was working for the U.S. government, right? Yeah. So it's friends, <laughs> you know, friends of long, really long standing, fifteen year standing, going. I just read in the media that you worked for the U.S. government. You know, they felt a bit kind of betrayed. And friends in Colombia. Yeah, friends in Colombia. So what who, did you tell them when you were? I was in construction. <laughs> Amazing. So but, you, know, mean, you had a, no choice, didn't you? You couldn't. Well, no. I mean, it wasn't. I wasn't undercover. I wasn't a spy or anything. But it was just more like for your own protection. You just don't want to go around announcing that. You don't want to draw attention to yourself. I, I had a bulletproof vehicle, changed houses all the time. You know, had long hair, short hair, just dressed down, just kept a low profile. And that was part of the job was just keeping your mouth shut and being discreet. And that meant not telling. I didn't. I was living with a girl at the time, and uh, I didn't tell her. So when I did finally tell her, she felt like you know I'd been lying to her, and mm. you know I had been, but I was doing it. I guess for the right reasons but it's also it's not a good way to live i don't you know i, I really as i said i wasn't a spy but when i see movies about people who who lie you know because of their their job or their career path i do feel a lot of um, empathy towards them because they're doing it for the right reasons but you're also lying to the people you love around you so it's a really difficult way to conduct your life particularly if you're you know an honest and open person yeah. which i like to think i am but i guess everyone does <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely well i'm conscious of the time uh -huh. but um the book's out now yep Colombiano. I've, I've brought my copy along so I can get a little bit of uh, a personalized uh, uh -huh. scribble in there from yourself. Sure. But, um, Do you want me to sign your guitar as well? <laughs> oh, I didn't bring that next time. <laughs> um, but I'll put links up so people can go and purchase the book. Uh -huh. I'll work out where the best places are. But uh -huh. um, I got mine through Booktopia, so that uh -huh. seems to be a, a good 
good spot. Yeah, it's on uh, iBooks, Booktopia for the ebook format, Amazon, I think, and then obviously all the uh, wonderful Australian retails, most bookstores around the country are stocking Colombiano and Marching Paddle. Sounds good. And Wildlands is out in a couple of weeks, yep. so I'll put links up once that's uh, once that's out. So Thanks, you can Andy. And check that out. But that's really cool. But wow, <laughs> I feel a little bit more enlightened. <laughs> thank you, mate. <laughs> thank you. Great questions, and I uh, really enjoyed. It. Yeah, thanks. Enjoyed awesome. your program. Cheers. Thanks, thank you. buddy. Thank you, folks. If you want to check out Rusty's stuff, I'm going to have everything over at andysocial.net. You can uh, purchase the first book, Marching Powder, which I mentioned at the beginning of the episode and obviously Rusty has spoken about in this episode itself, um, and his new book, Colombiano, as well. So I'm going to have everything over in the show notes, andysocial.net. As with all the previous guests on my episode, I've got my bird in the background just screeching. So if you can hear that, it's uh, my brand new cockatiel called Larry Burb. Yes, Larry Burb. Anyway, moving along, uh, everything's going to be over at andysocial.net, so be sure to check that out. Um, as always, housekeeping. If you want to support the podcast, go over to my website. You can click on the Amazon portal link if you regularly shop through Amazon. By clicking through that affiliate link, I get a small commission of whatever you buy. Don't worry. If you buy anything sus, I don't know who it is. I don't know what you buy. I just get a nice little uh, commission at the end of it. So don't stress. Um, I've also got a PayPal button on there. So if you ever want to fling me 50 cents or a dollar or whatever it might be, feeling generous, want to get warm and fuzzy, do that. It's there for you to use or not. Most importantly, you're listening to this episode and you're listening to me carry on now. That means the most to me. So thank you so much as always. Um, if you want to support the band, lord.net.au you can find lord on all of the social media platforms yes it's a very crap word in order to do searches for so uh, if you type lord metal or lord australia metal or lord band you'll find us don't worry we're all over the place so if you want to check us out do that plug 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 all right guys that's enough enjoy thank you so much and i'll be back next week with another great episode great episode if i do say so myself of the anti-social podcast take care guys bye-bye